So welcome everyone again. Uh, so we are, uh, I am excited to be kicking off our conference with this important uh, geopolitical uh, panel with an excellent lineup of speakers on a topic which is uh, very important for all of us. Uh, if I may, I'd like to start uh, with introducing all our panelists. Uh, we have today uh, Ms. Olga Bialkova. Uh, Olga is Director on Corporate and International Affairs of Gas TSO of Ukraine. So Olga, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you. And uh, Olga is pr responsible for promoting and protecting interests of uh, the company in the international area, arena and among key regulatory bodies. Uh, or, uh, she is also previously a member of the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, for the three for three terms between 2012 and 2020, and we have Mr. Matthew Baldwin, who just arrived from Brussels. <laughs> and Matthew, thank you, thank you for joining us today. And uh, Matthew Baldwin is Deputy Director General uh, for Energy at the European Commission, and uh, he is responsible for the Energy Platform Task Force, which aims to end the EU's dependence on Russian gas as soon as possible. So, which is, the, I think, the critical mission for all of us. And uh, Matthew is uh, in this position uh, with the EU Commission since June 1st, 2022, right? Okay, excellent. And of course, we have my dear friend Ana Palacio, our board director also at the Atlantic Council and uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain. Uh, Ana Palacio, everybody uh, probably knows, she's an international lawyer specializing in international and European Union law. And she was a member of the EU Parliament also between uh, 1994 and 2002. And uh, for the time being, she is visiting professor of, uh, you know, Edmund Wall School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Anna, welcome, and thanks for joining us. And uh, we have really excellent and uh, line of speakers. I strongly, uh, you know, encourage everyone also to check uh, our webpage. And you also have, uh, you know, uh, you can check also online the, all the bios that if you are, would like to learn more of our speakers. So, uh, so we will be discussing in implication of uh, geopolitical and energy market volatility to clean energy transition today. And uh, as I said, I'm very excited to kick off the panel. Uh, as you, uh, we may all know, energy markets have faced an unprecedented volatility this year, and we have much to discuss. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has, of course, been the defining geopolitical event of the year. Energy has been one of the key battlegrounds of the war, a battleground that recently turned violent with the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage. And last week's decision by OPEC on significant production cuts at, added unfortunately further pressure and uncertainty to the energy world. But what does this mean for the energy transition? Traditionally, higher fossil fuel prices create incentive for the adoption of clean energy. However, in the current environment, energy security concerns are paramount on many people's minds. Current energy crisis also changed the developments and expectations in regard to energy transition globally. There is no question that Ukraine war changed all energy transition calendar of the globe. COP26 ambitious 2030 emission reductions that align with reaching net zero by middle of the century may even more be dif more difficult to achieve in this new era. So, considering all the developments, I'm hoping to discuss how Europe will cope with the recent crisis while also to meet zero emission targets, or if this, is, this can be an opportunity for Europe and its closed region to speed up with this energy transition and how Ukraine can play a role in Europe's energy future and mix once the war is, war is over. So with that general question, I would like to turn to my uh, first panelist uh, to take her remarks, Olga. So, uh, so this is my question. So I'd like to you know, get your view uh, on uh, your general ass assessment how things are and how you see, not only as an energy expert, but as a Ukrainian, 
uh, all these recent geopolitical developments and uh, uh, what are the most biggest challenges that you are facing right now? Thank you, Daphne. Do you hear me? Is my mic working? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is very sad and very difficult day for me. Today, no, it's not working. Well, it's not, my not, I think <laughs> that you have to bring it a bit upwards. Yeah, no. Is it working yeah, now? No, okay, yes. perfect. Um, <clears throat> as I said, it is a very difficult day today for me to you know, represent Ukraine, to speak to you. I'm sure most of you have read your morning papers and you know that all across Ukraine today is uh, another evidence that Russia acts as a terrorist uh, state. Most of the cities are under uh, airstrike al uh, alarm. Uh, the shootings were happening in Kyiv, lives were lost, critical infrastructure was damaged. This is what is happening today in Ukraine. But still, it is my duty and honor to be the true daughter of Ukraine and to project today in my remarks that despite the very difficult moment of our history, we see ourselves as a solution to many energy problems in Europe. And I wish when I was a politician, some politicians in Brussels, in Berlin, were more attentive of our warnings, more supportive of what Ukraine was trying to achieve. Today, if we just imagine that the war is miraculously over tonight, I know it's not possible, but even if it would be over, do you think we could go to business as before in terms of energy? I don't think so. The company I represent right now is a company which has dual mandate. We transport, we still transport, despite the war, despite the very difficult circumstances for our workers, we still transport gas from Russia to Europe. The remains of it. We do it because the system was built in such a way that uh, we have to continue because we need to supply heating and gas for our own citizens which is of crucial importance. This is not a luxury solution for them. This is a basic humanitarian need. That is why my company continues its service. You will see me checking emails and uh, my text messages as we will communicate over these two days. Every minute I get text messages that some of our objects are being damaged. Next day I know that if military agrees, our workers go, they fix the system, and we continue our business. This is how serious we take our international obligations. Once again, I wish everybody was, uh, was more attentive to our uh, promises and claims. Because back a few years ago, when I was advocating against some derogations and exemptions which were granted to Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, unfortunately, we didn't have full understanding. With now uh, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 being out of service, you, Europe has to reconsider how it gets its own uh, gas supply. And unfortunately, even though we all share the dream, the decarbonized future is ahead of us and we need to do more to uh, you know, expedite the process, we also understand that we have to find a way how to replace some of the Russian gas with new sources. So ahead of my next uh, uh, answer, I have to say that if we do not find a way how to make Ukraine a key solution to some of the major problems of Europe, you know, it's, we will see continuous uh, you know, problems arising one after another. And I think even today we can showcast how Ukraine is doing, you know, besides transit, besides consideration of transit, we also export electricity as of now, which is of crucial importance to some of the neighboring countries. We store gas in our 
storages uh, because it is becoming very important uh, with the fluctuation of uh, uh, prices uh, on European markets and we see how the changes of prices may be uh, too you know, detrimental effect to some of the countries nearby. We have storages. We are offering them at very discounted price. It gives us confidence in continuation of use of our own infrastructure, but it also brings stability to European uh, region at large. We have, uh, you know, we agreed with uh, many of the minister, uh, ministers in uh, Brussels that we all have to reconsider how to uh, how to decrease consumption of uh, natural gas. We are doing our part as well for that. But of course, we are working on replacing uh, the gas uh, supply to Europe. Ukraine as a country which has vast uh, reserves of natural gas can benefit from joining efforts with Europe, with America, with uh, Canada, with other uh, major players in uh, production of gas. We need to do that. And of course, biomass and hydrogen is a huge promise for our company as well of how the gas infrastructure could be utilized. With that in mind, let me just say, yes, it is difficult, but Ukraine is not a victim. We are working how to, you know, on our plans, how to enhance our own system, how to make sure that we don't depend on Russia. By no means we want any of that anymore. But Europe also is independent from Russia and from its geopolitical and harmful energy influence on its own politics. Thank you. Uh, Olga, thank you very much for your uh, remarks coming bottom of your heart and your mind, Inerja. So uh, you, sh you know that we are all with Ukraine and Inerja and we are supporting all people of Ukraine, no need to say. And thank you for being with us today. Uh, so, um, uh, Olga, you, uh, thank you for your remarks, you know, just this, uh, this is very useful and uh, maybe uh, very quickly I'd like to turn to uh, Matthew Baldwin, you know, just if you can uh, comment on a bit, you know, just uh, what Olga just has said and uh, how you, s so what is the role that EU can play apart from the problems that EU is already facing mm -hmm. that to help Ukraine as well? And uh, among the list that she has just uh, went through, and uh, <coughs> and then I'll come to the other questions on the EU. So we okay. Thank you. Well, firstly, thank you, Daphne, for inviting me. Thanks to the Atlantic Council. Wonderful to be back in the astonishing city of Istanbul, and uh, and thank you, Olga, for putting a human answer first. Uh, I mean, as a, as a, as a lifelong technocrat. We can't just rely on a technocratic response to these issues. We have to speak from the heart and say, this is what it's about. And when I think about what your company has been through, you know, people have been out there fixing power lines under fire. People have been trying to keep things going under appalling uh, personal circumstances. So I think that's the first thing we should remember. I mean, now we're going to descend into a great technocratic discussion, but that human element mustn't be forgotten because and it's important because it's it'd be easy for us not just in Europe but across the world to just sort of slip back and say oh the war's still going on right you know it's going on but it's people involved anyway I stop just on, on, on what has happened and and in, in terms of energy what I think it brings home to us very clearly is that European sorry EU and Ukrainian and by the way Turkish energy security is deeply intertwined we are joined at the hip and uh, you know, for that reason, you've shown extraordinary resilience. You, the Ukrainian people, but you in the energy sector have shown this incredible resilience. Um, and we are also proud. Uh, uh, you, you rightly said we should have done more to anticipate what was coming, but we are proud of the way we stepped up. I mean, just as an example, the incredibly rapid synchronization uh, of our electricity uh, processes. And I just want to assure you, and what you've heard at much more important levels than me, but also assure this audience that we will be every bit as strong in supporting your reconstruction on the energy side as on the rest of it, where we will stand side by side with you, shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder, building back better. And that cliche means a lot, lot more in, in this sense. And let's think about what we can do in the future. Moving out from electricity trade into other areas, there's lots of things we could do together. 
So uh, it's great to hear what you've said. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, thank you. Uh, but um, do you think the conflict in Euro uh, Ukraine will turn out to have accelerated Europe's transition to a low carbon economy? You know, just uh, so let's talk a bit about also, you know, since actually the general uh, topic of our conference is clean energy, you know, just so uh, like to move a bit more away from geopolitics and uh, to low carbon economy and uh, uh, this is also a biggest cha uh, challenge, as I, we, I have already, you know, uh, mentioned in my intro remarks. Uh, uh, this is a challenge I had if in front of Europe and all European countries, you know, just a while uh, everybody, you know, just more started, you know, left, you know, uh, closed up nuclear, you know, moved towards more, you know, uh, hydrocarbon uh, resources and more towards renewable, but with the now new prices, you know, uh, in international markets and high market volatility in, you know, uh, energy prices, you know, how you can actually, you know, uh, build a, you know, um, a system that can support, you know, towards the energy transition in EU and what is, what will be the biggest challenge for you guys? That's quite a question. Definitely, you just put. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I think, I mean, in essence, can we accelerate our transition towards um, the green promised land? The answer is yes. Do you want to say a bit more? I can. Um, I mean, I think it, it may be surprising to two, to, to two groups of people. Firstly, to the people who thought we already had a very ambitious green plan. Can we take that further and can we take it faster? Um, but also to the people who said, and by the way, they said the same thing when COVID hit. Oh, well, now because of this war, we have to postpone all this, you know, European Green Deal rubbish. You know, we have to focus on the real priorities. And the answer is, of course, is that's a total fallacy. Uh, we can't go down that, that road. And what the Ukrainian war brings home to us in a, in a very meaningful way, and you said it, Olga, is we've got to end our crazy dependence on gas coming from Russia. Um, I've got a bad joke, uh, which is this is a chicken and egg situation. We put all our eggs in one basket, and now the chickens are coming home to roost. And that's almost literally what we've done uh, in the context of over, um, uh, uh, over putting our, um, uh, uh, our energy security on, on Russia. If you think back not very long ago, about 20 years ago, Germany, just to pick one country, was getting about one-third of its gas from Norway, one-third of it from, from the Netherlands, from Groningen and about one third from Russia. And those dependency levels changed. We became more dependent on Russia, even as the situation became worse. And I'm not singling Germany out for this. We did this collectively. We made this mistake. Now it's changing very rapidly. We're down to, I think, about 7% of our gas is now coming from Russia, at least on pipeline. We've managed to replace an incredible amount of gas over the course of this year with LNG, mainly from the United States, but not just from the United States, and also from, with pipeline gas coming from other sources, notably Norway. And that's great. And of course, it's a function, by the way, of price. That we're paying these uh, uh, mouth, uh, eye-watering uh, prices. And by the way, I should say, Europe's in a fortunate position to be able to pay those prices. I mean, we've been able to take a greater share because the prices have been taking countries like Pakistan and, and others out of the market. But we need to do so much more, and that's why we came forward with the Repower Plan, which is, if you like, addressing an eternal triangle, but a triangle maybe we forgot about, which is energy security on the one side, affordability on the third, second side, and thirdly, not forgetting the sustainability, this minor existential crisis we call climate change. We mustn't lose sight of that. What do we have to do then? And Repower sets it up very clearly. We need to diversify our energy sources. We need to absolutely get out of gas from Russia, but we also need to think about how, in the longer term, we can accelerate that. Secondly, we need to reduce our demand in the short term. And again, we've done a lot. We brought forward a big plan. First time we've acted so fast at the European level, 15% reductions across the scale. And thirdly, accelerate the green energy transition. Bump up that renewables rate from 40 to 45%. Bump up the energy efficiency rate from 9 to 13 percent. I told you I was going to be technocratic and I am. But we can do these things, we must do these things, and we must put even more money into it, an additional 200 billion on top of what was planned for 55. So, we're on it. 
we've got to go faster, um, we can go faster, it's the signal and we will be judged on that. I'm ready to be judged on that. Fair enough, Matthew. And as you say, you know, maybe the only problem that it is uh, you, uh, you cannot come together and decide. You know, it takes ages, you know, it's a long time. As you know, recently you also, uh, I think it was uh, today, you know, just the EU couldn't decide on the, you know, gas uh, price ceiling, you know, just that's supposed to be set on, you know, but uh, this is the way it is. But Good luck with that. And from there, I like to, I like to, you know, just turn to Anna because she's looking at me and Anna Palacio, you know, just so. Uh, uh, I know that, you know, just so you have a lot to say what Matt, uh, Matthew Baldwin has j uh, just said, and also from your perspective as also uh, uh, an energy expert, a lawyer, and uh, former, you know, minister of Spain, and how you see the things. Uh, now, uh, with all these new recent challenges uh, coming from uh, Ukraine and also as a European yourself. Uh, this is a tall order. <clears throat> but anyway, first, and even if time is a scarce commodity, uh, almost as complicated as gas today, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, to the Atlantic Council and thank you, Daphne, because the... I mean, the title of our session is broader, is geopolitics and, uh, and uh, the transition. And you have centered it in the, the weak link or the complex link, which is Europe. But first, let me just say a couple of things. As a matter of disclosure, I have a nuclear past. I was a proud member of the executive committee of Arriva when Arriva was one of the great in the world. And I was in charge of international, so geopolitics. Second, I have been senior vice president and general counsel of the World Bank Group, which will be important for what I want to say. And uh, I will start by saying Ukraine. What Ukraine has told us is the courage and the fact that when you are in a deep crisis, the worst crisis of all is a war, you, have, you cannot set aside your ambitions, even if these ambitions seem extremely difficult to reach. I, therefore, I'm confident about, uh, not probably not this COP, but about the result, about decarbonization. Because, and I will just come back to that, I think the green thing is very ideological. What we need first and foremost is decarbonization and not do strange contortions to call gas a green. Gas is not green. Gas decarbonizes. There is no better way of decarbonizing than bringing one megawatt hour of coal to one megawatt hour of gas. Of course, you may tell me that, okay, well, renewables today, and you would be right, but renewables have the problem that they are not baseload. And we need base load, and this is the problem with gas. So this, would be, this is my, my first comment. But I think that um, you have said something on which I really do not agree. We made this collectively when speaking about uh, Germany being hooked, because this is what it was. Germany was dependent, got uh, voluntarily this dependence on Russian gas, although there were many of us telling them since... I mean, see, of course, since the Nord Stream 2 was designed in 2014, after the invasion of Ukraine, of uh, Crimea. Uh, and Germans just, there, there was, there is nothing that made them more, I would say, reactive than when you would mention this, the dependence on Russia. And the answer was, uh, during the Cold War, Russia was the most reliable and the most, you know, this was the issue. And they, I mean, I, I could uh, speak about anecdotes, but we don't have time. This is, this is important. It's not that we collectively. What we have to understand, and you have mentioned uh, it, is that, I mean, European Union is a great success. But when we think European energy, European Union energy, we think of goods in the internal market, we think of a market of the, the, the energy, 
or we even in uh, some we think of the success of the European Union in uh, in the the uh, vaccines issue. There, the European Union did not have competencies. The treaty did not allow. And I'm sorry to speak about the treaty, but the treaty is fundamental. Why? Because this is not like the internal market goods. This is not the. It's it's not even clearly not European, not European Union level. It's extremely ambiguous. And this is this ambiguity that I think is very important for where we are here. Because in the end, we have been working in the European Union on three assumptions. None of them were true. One is that there is a European energy union. That there is, and that we were building it. And then we could go, we could go towards uh, renewables, because, okay, well, you know, the grid, exchange, interconnections, it would solve it. It's not true. I mean, it's not true. Because of what? Because in the end, there, were, there was a unwilling reliance on nuclear, because uh, in the end, uh, France was there, and other countries, uh, I would say, courageous countries, and the next panel, we have a representative from Romania that can tell us about this policy on keeping nuclear and on betting on nuclear. But the truth is that in this ideology of green, nuclear was a no-no. Nuclear was to the, I mean, absolutely, uh, of course, this, this was the, but the third is that nobody was telling us how hooked we were on Russian gas. And nobody willingly, I mean, Germany knew, Germany did not want, and others, Italy was also extremely uh, uh, dependent on. So these three elements that now, of course, the chickens came to roost, absolutely. Am I optimistic? Yes, because I think that it is precisely when you are confronted with a very difficult situation that you, you have, I mean, in the European Union, it's always like that, that you have the courage to have the political will to interpret this 194 article in a non-ambiguous way. Because the, the, if you read the article, you go first paragraph, fantastic, this is the Euro European Union level. Then you read the second, and, that, and, and then you come to the, to the, to the energy mix and you know that, that Euro, the, the European level cannot do. And without having a say in the energy mix, you can be efficient. You can just promote, coordinate. It's this soft power that unless you have a uh, political will, you get nowhere. And my last comment. And of course, why is this crucial, as said? Because uh, all the commodities have been have been in uh, or are in jeopardy today because of the of the uh, of the war but let's not fool ourselves the gas was rising before the war there was a challenge of we you have mentioned um, or in the introduction it has been mentioned the fertilizers which is food security I mean right now Pakistan cannot just close the the bids on providers for suppliers for gas in 2026. And, uh, as, uh, and uh, you have Bangladesh that has cuts. And we go there with strong euros and we buy and we are, I mean, we are creating a, uh, uh, I mean, consequences because we still have euros. We may be, uh, have difficulties, but our euros are there. There are countries that cannot afford that. And this is where we need to put our, I mean, our collective ambitions and our policies, understanding that our energy equation is fundamental, but that we cannot, we Europeans, cannot, cannot lose sight of the world equation. And we have been not financing anything except uh, uh, renewables, for instance, we can speak about that. So I think that this is the crux of the issue. Uh, Anna, I agree uh, a lot of things that you have said. Uh, just uh, before, uh, I would like to move again to 
you, you know, if I may, you know, so if I think you may be willing to answer some of some of sure. her comments. I have to. Because this has been respond. getting a very, uh, you know, lively debate. In the meantime, I'd like to remind you all that, you know, we uh, please also don't forget to join us on social media. We, uh, we have a, you know, with the clean and we are conference hashtag clean energy outlook and also uh, at IAC Global Energy and at AC Istanbul uh, and uh, AC Atlantic Council. So please continue to follow us and tweet the sessions and conference as uh, while watching. So thank you for doing that. And yeah, so Matthew. So, so uh, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what Anna said. Um, it's hard to disagree with it. Um, I think those of us who spent too much time in Brussels, and I'm afraid, Anna, I count you in that group as well, we do sometimes tend to obsess a bit about, you know, more Europe, less Europe, you know, the, the role for the Commission against the role for member states and that internal balance. And energy is just about the perfect playground for that debate, you know, in terms of the issues. And why? Because if you're a member state, there's, there's not much more fundamental in a modern society than the responsibility and your autonomy as a country in terms of, you know, your own energy security. And you're right, <coughs> we've lost sight of that, I think, in recent times. And at the same time in Europe, we've already done quite a lot. We have, you mentioned, we have this nascent European energy union. We have a strong internal energy market, which has made, for example, electricity, it's made us fabulously efficient in terms of how much infrastructure we've had to bring to the table. Um, now, when you look at the nature of this crisis, though, and this is where I really fundamentally agree with you, the nature of it, the fact of we might not have enough gas to get through this winter, or we might not be able to pay for it, that really means we have to act collectively. It's not a choice. It's a question of how quickly we do it and how efficiently we do it. And that's why we've acted so, I think, I'm proud of what we've done so fast. You say we're slow, and we, yes, we can be grindingly slow, but on the saving gas for a safe winter package, we conceived of the idea on the 28th of June. We passed it through the Commission on the 25th of July after a, an absolute marathon of technocratic work. And we got it through the Council in the first week of August. Boom! We have to act fast and we can act fast. And believe you me, there'll be more coming because we haven't touched the... the we've only, only just scratched the surface of what can be achieved if we are willing to work flexibly and not just because the Commission told you to do it, but flexibly and quickly to deliver on the right solutions for Europe and our neighbours, uh, Ukraine and, of course, Turkey as well. We're all in this uh, picture together. It was yeah. almost as much oh, of a yeah, rant please. as yours, wasn't it? No, <laughs> this is great. You know, this is getting <laughs> even more exciting. I we may even need, need more time, you know, so please, yeah. Yeah, so, Matthew, uh, let me start by thanking you for reacting quickly this time when the crisis uh, started uh, back in February. I cannot express how grateful Ukrainian people are for all the humanitarian, political and uh, energy support as well. Well, you're fighting for us, if I may say. Oh, so, yes, we're grateful to yes, you. Yes, and we will remind, uh, we will remind uh, Brussels as well many, <laughs> many times. And uh, let me just tell, I also have nuclear past. As a uh, deputy chairwoman of the Energy Committee, you know, I was advocating for extension and, you know, very pragmatic approach to nuclear in my own country, where it serves as a, a base load. Uh, I also have uh, passed with NTSOE, and I was advocating for our accession. And, of course, the conversation about both topics were completely different in my tenure as a politician. I had completely different arguments from our German colleagues once again about their over-dependence on uh, Russian gas. So, okay, well, that was past. What about future? What do we do in future? Once again, Anna, I'm not ashamed of saying um, gas has future, you know, in the near, you know, near midterm. For countries like Ukraine, there is nothing I can replace it with to heat, you know, the homes of millions of Ukrainians. We don't use gas for electricity. We use it mainly for heating of our houses. And yes, winter is coming and it is very cold. Mm. So I'm sorry, this is reality. And I actually know that what is the reality of some of our partners. We are not just neighbors. 
we are candidates. Indeed. So we get to know the troubles of our uh, neighbors as well. We understand the issues in Hungary. We understand uh, the issues in Romania. We understand potential of increasing our friendship and energy co uh, cooperation with Turkey. We sit in a beautiful city which has potential to bring all of us more peace and stability by encouraging and making sure that you know more LNG terminals are open. Yes, I want to see it decarbonized. Probably my kids will. But in my tenure, I have to be responsible for Ukraine, for some of the European countries. We have to plan what do we do with gas. I can be also technocratic. <laughs> I was trained as one of them. So I think it's, it's time for Europe to look at this situation as kind of uh, sort of like Basel uh, rules style for Europe. One country cannot and should not be allowed, even if it's a very strong and very rich country, be over-dependent on one source of supply. From now on, it's not, it should not be possible. We should also diversify. That's why, you know, we should have some rules. You cannot have more than one third of your critical gas or, you know, energy source being delivered with politically you know, driven agreements. Gazprom was sponsoring kindergartens in some of the cities Football. of uh, Germany. This is, this is not, you know, market rules. And, you know, not to mention, once again, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Then we should, we should actually re-evaluate, re, re you know, for some countries, like in my case, I, I was explicitly saying we cannot replace gas because of the humanitarian crisis. But some countries can actually do it. And, you know, European Commission should prescribe on a general level how to switch off in case of emergency. Because crisis is different in, you know, con country, cold countries and, you know, some of the southern uh, partners. But I'm not, I'm not diminishing no, but, troubles. No, I mean, not at all, but... Uh... I mean, you are preaching to a convert. I mean, <laughs> among other things, I'm a director at the TSO uh, in Spain, so I know the issues of gas from, it, from this perspective as well. No, what I think is that in the, in the European Union and uh, the South, I, first I think that the South and the East, we should get closer together well, we are and, and discuss because your misunderstanding of the Mediterranean is as big as, as our misunderstanding of Russia. That's the truth in very geopolitical terms. So we better think and acknowledge and Turkey is a good place to be because Turkey yeah. is hinge to mm. so many of these issues and we are in it together. And the first thing to address, of course, as us is is enlargement, but coming back, huh? no, coming back to the to the energy, uh, of course, the transition of gas that the European Commission just almost told us that we were standing on stranded assets, the the gas transportation were stranded gas assets. We all know in this room that if tap tan up exists is thanks to the pressure of the United States to have what the European Commission stands for. Diversity of roots, diversity of origins, diversity, all this. But it was the United States that pushed, pushed us to, to get there because there was this, com this comfortable position vis-a-vis -vis what, uh, what we, we were doing. So, first thing, the transition of gas will happen, but it will be longer. Second, in very practical terms, we, among other issues, pushed by this idea that gas was almost closed, we have discarded long-term contracts. We were buying on the spot market in LNG, which is one of our dependencies, and we have let the long-term supply uh, contracts with Nigeria, with, I'm not speaking about I'm speaking about long-term supply. And now we are competing among ourselves and going to Qatar and competing among Germany with X, with Y, with Z. Exactly. It, it's meant for himself. 
Exactly. So exactly. we need to, to reassess. And the European Commission has to have a, honestly, a self examine uh, certain parameters, ideological parameters of this Green Deal that went from farm to fork to um, agriculture to everything. Everything was green. And it's not that I'm not green, but you know, you get to, uh, to intellectual oxymorons. Gas is not green. It decarbonizes, which is our main challenge for the planet. And then you may have other policies that will take into account other aspects. The same way that you cannot say that you don't want nuclear because nuclear harms or goes against the principle of do not harm because of, of, uh, of uh, just spent fuel. Honestly, nuclear is the best way to decarbonize and the, uh, the uh, I mean, the OECD, the International Energy Agency, has been pre repeating this for years. But no, we didn't want nuclear. We, we didn't, I mean, we didn't want gas, but we were hooked. I mean, the European Commission has to come clean and to have, I mean, honestly, an examination of... Okay. There are <laughs> fantastic things, okay. but other... I need to come clean, but okay. <laughs> Well, of course, you are the European I was, Commission. You go first. I, no, you are the European Commission. You cannot agree. If you would agree, you would have done it. I mean, but well, honestly, I, seen from... I, I think I will help you to agree. Okay. Yeah? okay. Uh, who who, who well, wants well, to reply to Anna first? I'll go first. Matthew and, or then I, and then I well, prepare I, I my was, defense. Okay. I was Ladies, about to okay. name two more clauses, which I hope you will agree, and I hope it will bring some kind of peace between all of us. I actually think that, uh, you know, in terms of gas in particular, but we see it working with electricity right now. I think some solidarity mechanism between different countries, but agreed ahead of time. I don't want to see like, you know, this competition Russian to like Qatari to here and there and like and who, whose foreign minister is great at negotiating. You know, you, you have to kind of think, how do you really want to, to, to address the issue of gas if difficult even more difficult situation will come. And once again, let me remind you, I think Ukraine has something to offer here as well. Absolutely. And the centralized kind of bailout fund or reserve of gas is also important. I think, have we had enough of gas this season or beginning of this season? I think reaction to many issues, be it sanctions or, you know, uh, political decisions would have been easier for many politicians from, you know, European Union. And once again, Ukraine wants to participate in it. And that's why we advocated you to include Ukraine in storages into this package of uh, repower and the, the storage packages. I think that's, that's very important to prepare ahead of time, yeah. ahead of time. And of course, this winter is difficult, but what about next winter? Next winter is even more difficult in my estimations and my calculations of how to replace the share of Russian gas. I think I've got rather a lot to respond to, actually, here, if I may, yes, um, yeah. quickly. Yeah, please. Um, I mean, there's, a, there's actually a technocratic and there's a political answer to all the points that you've made. Um, and let me briefly begin with the technocratic one. Um, we've never pretended, Anna, that we weren't going to need gas all the way up and through the transition, all the way through 2050. It's there in Fit for 55. It's there in Repower EU. Yes, we've talked a lot about the Green Deal, and yes, we've talked a lot about renewables and energy efficiency and all those good things, and actually, no apologies for doing that, because we have to get the... Um... See, we do lots for Ukraine around here. <laughs> uh, but and no apologies for that, because we, um, we have to send the signal on investment in renewables. I mean, a lot of these things are for the longer term, but if we don't move ahead with them now, we won't be able to address our supply chains for wind plants and, and, and everything else and for solar. People have got to realize that this isn't just a, a short-term policy shift. It needs to be a long-time parity shift. And so really no apologies for that. And I don't therefore see a dichotomy between what you say is the green transition and decarbonizing. For me, these are these are going in the same direction, and we, we assume that. Now, you referred earlier to the ideological debate we had over this thing called the taxonomy issue, and I don't know how many people have 
broken their heads on this. I mean, that was a powerful uh, uh, discussion about priorities in, in the pre-war situation. And again, we need to figure out how, what signals we're going to send on investment. That's what's underlying all that. And all the headlines about the nuclear versus gas thing we missed the point that this was a fundamental attempt to shift our investment in, in, in that direction. And no apologies for that. Similar, second false dichotomy, if you like, is on the long-term contracts. Again, because we know we're going to need gas all the way up and through 2050, we are not afraid of long-term contracts. And by the way, it's not the European Union or the Commission that decides on that. We don't buy the gas. Member states don't buy the gas. It's companies that buy the gas. And the way a lot of gas is bought and sold in the European Union, and I'm probably the least experienced person in the room, but I'm clambering slowly up a very steep learning curve, is you buy the gas from the midstream guys. You're buying gas in seven to 10 year contract terms. And they're the ones who are assuming the long-term contracts and they are off taking and pushing it off in lots of different directions. So, you know, I don't think that's a fundamental problem. We are not afraid of that. I hear the same things from our friends on the US LNG side. Um, there have been recent long-term contracts and there will be. If you look at our pattern of imports just to take Norway, for example, 70% of that is under long-term contracts, only 30% of it is spot, and, and most of Norway's, I mean half, Norway exports half and half. So I think it's a... a, a I think no, it's but a, allow me one interjection. Okay. I, send the signals. You say about sending well, signals. I'm coming to that. What signals have you sent before I'm the coming Ukraine to that. Let me, let me come to the yeah. signals because, and then this, this addresses the points you've made and the things how we have to be, we have to do things differently. And we, I hear from both of you in your different ways how things have to be differently. We've lacked solidarity. We've lacked far-sighted views of security. Um, and we haven't had a sense of where we need to be. So that's why we've come. And it's the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, who's come forward with this idea of the energy platform to totally rethink how we address gas supply in Europe. And what are we trying to do with that? We're trying to do three things. Firstly, we're asking member states and through them companies to aggregate demand to pull together demand, to avoid this unsavory spectacle of people outbidding each other. We saw it this, just this summer on storage, people scrambling over each other to get the gas, bidding the prices up. It's not a good idea. Secondly, to look at our infrastructure. We don't have perfect infrastructure. It's a lot better than in the last Ukraine-Russia gas crisis when we were so dependent on the east-west flow. But it's not good enough. And that's why our, our prices are higher than they otherwise would be, because we have these infrastructural bottlenecks. So how can we use that better and make it better? And thirdly, we need to reach out to other parts of the world. Um, and I was myself, you mentioned Nigeria. I was in Nigeria in, in July. They want, to, they want those signals. Of course, it's a complicated story in Nigeria. We want them to send more gas out. And we are absolutely uh, ready to send those signals that we are looking for those upstream investments so that we can pull down more gas so that they can build a seventh train and an eighth train to bring more. Because, again, this isn't me walking away from the Green Deal. We need the gas. We just need it from different places. And it's a huge opportunity, in fact, to I, take us beyond, one last thing and then I stop, to take us into a, a green transition where we can have an honest conversation with the global south that says, yeah, if you didn't understand it before, we do now need your gas and we will help fund your green transition, and I'm not apologizing for using that word, because these are the places where they can produce hydrogen and renewables so much more efficiently. It's a fantastic deal. It's a new partnership we can we Well, can I build hope together. that you send this signal for hydrogen. We, for, hydrogen we, bank? We no, but, no, but yeah. not hydrogen bank. It has to go well beyond. If I agree. Not, if not, hydrogen will just... I'm at the, my third uh, coming of hydrogen. <laughs> Honestly. There'll be many more. But Anna, just on no, this, really. we announced in Repower 10 million tons of imported, 10 million tons yeah. of domestic, which is a big and ambitious target when there's... Yeah, no, but, okay. yeah. but we need to, you need to send a signal, and I know that you are doing this. Midcat is a good example. This is, <clears throat> this is a future hydrogen pipeline uh, from uh, the south, including, Algeri uh, including uh, Morocco and Algeria to the north, but France is blocking. I think that <clears throat> hydrogen, and you mentioned that, hydrogen is what will make the, the transition. I agree. Why don't you start by sending strong signals, like for instance, blending 3%, all the TSOs, blending 3%, giving, <coughs> giving, and, I mean, giving uh, encouragement to companies that will switch to, to green hydrogen. I mean, you know, practical things, Preaching hydrogen in abstract 
it's, it's important. And if the preaching is done by the European Commission, it's extremely important. And don't, I, I may die in the wood, uh, Europeanist and an admirer of what the Commission is, is doing. But honestly, green is not decarbonizing. For energy sources, the main issue today in order to just to address the, the climate change, which is the challenge, is decarbonizing. Therefore, the do not harm is something that we can just uh, I mean, openly, openly, because uh, the, this issue of taxonomy is too technical to address it here. But it would <laughs> never. <You mentioned this. laughs> is, okay, this is really fascinating, you know, just so, and I know I, you want to also make a no, comment, no, no, Olga, no, no. but uh, I also like the chance to uh, turn to the audience, you know, in, my, in our last 10 minutes in case we have questions. Otherwise, I also have a few questions to follow up if we, we don't have any other questions from the audience. So, um, so looking to the audience, you know, if they may have any questions to our panelists. We've stunned them into silence. <laughs> I think the debate was so uh, exciting that, you know, they, they other, were, but... you know, okay, ho, oh, here we go. And please, please introduce yourself as, as you ask your question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Indal. Um, I am representing um, Innovation Technologies. So, Talking about what uh, Anna, oh please, what Anna talked about. What about blue hydrogen? So yeah, we have oh, the green deal. Yeah, we have the gas, but nobody mentioned the blue hydrogen, which is the combination of the hydrogen economy, economy and the decarbonization. So yeah. what about that? Well, Where are you blue at? Blue and pink. Pink is from nuclear. Blue is from gas, but with car carbon capture, storage, and eventually usage. And of course, we need to be open to all this. We need to decarbonize. Everything that goes into decarbonization is good. We cannot afford anything else, among other issues, because nobody, we haven't mentioned, because there hasn't been time, but the reserves, so the, the I mean, we have, the, no, the reserve storage, but also the, I mean, the supply of gas, cannot increase indefinitely. And the moment post-COVID uh, China comes to the fore, we will have more difficulties. So absolutely, I think that we, this is what I would ask the commission, is more pragmatism. Uh, carbon capture, storage, and usage was very fashionable in year 2000. And so, but it has, it has disappeared. Then it was the thing for renewables, which is great, and, and nobody can interpret me that I'm not for, I, and what I would conclude is that if we are realistic, w uh, the European Union will keep being the, the, at the forefront of this net zero, which is the European Union, this is a tribute to the Commission. We are, honestly, we have been running with this banner since Kyoto, or even before. And we are bound on regulation. And regulation, in the end, gives you certain uh, security. Uh, security that things are not going to change from one day to the other. But we need to be, we need, we, yes, we need collectively, to be more realistic and do not leave anything that can decarbonize. On other, in other areas, green means things. When you address nature, when you address environment, but in the field of energy, let's not fool ourselves. Decarbonization is the maître mot. Uh, C'est bon. Oh, oh, uh, thank you, Anna. And yeah, Olga, you Okay, also? so uh, I learned a lot from Brussels, Matthew. Uh, I just <laughs> came back from a, a workshop on biomethane, and there was a very interesting quote on hydrogen I want to share with you. Uh, one of the uh, directors of the TSO, my peer, he said, like, I think it's very easy to talk about hydrogen because uh, it doesn't mean that I have to do something right now, right this second, today. And I decided, you know what, I had so many uh, debates about <coughs> hydrogen in, you know, in my last two years that from now on, anybody who comes to me and wants to talk about hydrogen, I will say, yes, what do I do today? <laughs> 
If nothing, then we switched about and we talk about biomethane because this is what I believe is very helpful both to Europe and to Ukraine. And I think let's not overlook biomethane as potential replacement of um, natural gas because it's also decarbonized. It is helping economies. It is affordable, yeah. more affordable, and it is serving different purpose. So diversification. It also means we are open for different technologies. We are all open for different ideas of how to solve the issue of natural gas. That would be my contribution about hydrogen. Just briefly, because I, I know we, we all want to talk a lot. And, and just on this one, um, yeah, I mean, blue hydrogen, fine. But again, we don't, no apologies on our side for the big stress on green hydrogen in Repower EU because. Again, it's about triggering those investment decisions. You're right, Olga, there's no green hydrogen to trade or ship or sell right now. It doesn't exist. We've got to send and signal, your word, that we are going in this direction. And that means thinking, yes, about pipelines and thinking about making sure that everything is H2 ready. Um, otherwise, it won't be there in 10 years time when we need it. So that's, I think, a function the European Union and the Commission can do quite well by setting these ambitious targets and really trying to make them happen. And uh, you tease me for mentioning the hydrogen bank, but there are a lot of initiatives out there for, for developing these new chains and developing and um, making people realize that ultimately there'll be a lot of money to be made from this. And why not? Looks like we will be speaking uh, a lot on hydrogen in the coming years. And uh, we have a session actually on hy hydrogen tomorrow. So I really, you know, encourage, you know, we continue that conversation on hydrogen tomorrow we, all together again. And we'll uh, be tackling it, by the way, in the energy platform. So we're not going to leave it there. Yeah. So uh, I think there is, um, I saw, uh, okay, yeah, please. And then uh, Ambassador Rende. You also have a question? You don't have a question, uh, okay. Burhan Yüksek, Kash Bloomberg News. Uh, first of all, as a local, I would like to say welcome to all of our guests. Welcome to Istanbul. Uh, I have two questions, uh, one for Mr. Baldwin and one for Ms. Palacio. Uh, Mr. Baldwin, uh, last week we had uh, Turkey-Azerbaijan Energy Forum in Istanbul and uh, Azerbaijan pledged uh, increased uh, amount of gas flowing to uh, Europe and it will be uh, through Turkey, Southern Gas Corridor. But at the same time, in the same week, uh, European officials came visited uh, Turkish officials in terms of uh, Turkey's trade and getting closer and closer with uh, Russia after the war erupted economically. Um, how will this uh, proceed? Uh, on one hand, uh, Turkey is a vital uh, energy hub and the amount of energy, amount of uh, gas will increase. But on the other hand, uh, warnings are coming, uh, warnings about possible steps, possible sanctions, um, and uh, Turkey is in talks with Russia uh, about delaying payments, energy payments. Uh, how do you see how uh, these events will unfold? And I have uh, one for Mrs. Uh, Ms. Palacio. Uh, before the war, as you said, uh, the gas prices were rising before the war. And uh, I would like to ask you before and after the war, because uh, uh, we were following uh, Atlantic Council and, and the events, and Turkey was seen as like a country rupturing from the West, both by Atlantic Council and the many by the West. Uh, we've seen French flight carriers in the Eastern Mediterranean. We've seen, you know, some exchanges. We still see uh, with some European leaders, a Turkish president, uh, have exchanges, uh, but after the war, uh, both in terms of security and energy and diplomacy, I think uh, Turkey's uh, role has changed. And can you assess what happened before and after uh, Turkey's position uh, in the Western alliance? Thank you for the question. A long question. We it's last two minutes, so. Uh, which one you want to take? You want to go oh, first, Anna? No, I mean... Okay, well, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be very quick. Um, it's a great question, and it's actually a microcosm of the discussions we've been having about diversity and so on, because both Turkey and the EU say, faced similar questions of dependency on Russia. And Azerbaijan, for both of us, is part of the answer, which is why the Southern Gas Corridor is so critical, why we're so pleased that it's you know, planning to double its, its uh, capacity, 
Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure Turkey is looking to get more gas from Azerbaijan, and, and so are we. Um, so we're, I'm looking forward to discussing these issues with the uh, Deputy Energy Minister of Turkey later today. It's very important that we think about these things together. We have a, an, an honest and straightforward dialogue. Um, but Azerbaijan indeed is one of the ways we can all get off Russian gas quickly because we're going to need gas in our pipes all the way through 2050. So, Anna. Well, um, the easy question for me. I will just put forward a disclaimer. I belong to those Europeans that understand that Turkey within the European project is in our interest. And this I have, I don't have to claim because I have evidences <coughs> in the different positions I have held that I have stood. And this is not before the war, it's well before. There has been a transition there. And Turkey has affirmed itself as a hinge power, as a regional power. And Turkey right now is, is there. If you ask me about the, the NATO issue, the, it would take us that it's Turkey and Hungary, the two countries that are blocking the access to Finland and, uh, and Sweden. <clears throat> and I would say that I hope and I expect that Turkey understands that being a hinge means also being a, a loyal partner where you belong, which is in NATO. But the European Union, I'm not going to speak about NATO because this would bring us to the Americans and all this and I don't, but the European Union has also to understand that our dialogue with Turkey has to, I mean, has to be different. And my last word is that I expect, and I wrote an article on in that sense, the day before yesterday, I can send it to the Atlantic Council and if anyone is interested, that Ukraine is putting us against the wall. We have been in a kind of a, uh, main paralysis in how to address the, the, main, the enlargement, but not in the classical sense, because I think that the world has changed, but the how to do with the candidates countries. And I think that uh, Ukraine, because of its um, exceptionality, will make us move, which is welcome, and find, and find different, I mean, a, a different approach, which doesn't mean create a kind of parking lot, and I'm not going to mention certain meetings that could be interpreted as parking lots for, for candidate countries. No, I just addressing how to bring in these different countries with different, uh, with, uh, with different circumstances. I think that this is going to be another of the benefits of Ukraine. Thank you so much, uh, Ana Palacio. And I'd like to thank you, uh, thank all our panelists, Ana Palacio, Olga Bialkov, and Matthew Baldwin for joining us today and also great uh, audience. And I think this has been a wonderful debate. So I will not summarize the take out because I think, uh, I mean, we all heard, you know, just so, and uh, uh, our panelists did an excellent job. Uh, and uh, so on behalf of myself and our Atlantic Council, thank you. And uh, so uh, with this, uh, I'd like to, you know, uh, announce that, you know, our, ne yeah, this, uh, you know, give a big applause. So I'll, uh, well, before leaving the floor, you know, I'd like to announce our next panel on how to apply nuclear reactors in developing countries, which I agree that uh, nuclear is actually green, you know, with you, Anna, on that, and uh, moderated by our uh, deal Olga Karkova from Atlantic Council, uh, Deputy Director of European Energy Security at the Global Energy Center. Olga joined us today from Washington, D.C. Olga, okay, floor is yours with your panelists. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you. Thank you.